Hello everyone, this is Razor, and I'm going to try this whole podcast thing. Now, I've, long story short, not really a long story, but i try to keep this brief. I've always wanted to do a podcast. I like listening to multiple podcasts uh, from, you know, groups of people, uh, sometimes just two people, or just one person. And I've always kind of want, like, waited for the opportunity to arise to find a group of people uh, to do it with that I thought, you know, would be entertaining and something that we could do for a long time. But, like, that never really happened, and I, I still want to do I always, I always have, you know, now that I've been on YouTube for, uh, the better part of six years, um, I have no, uh, absolute problems at all talking for a length of time all by myself, so I'm gonna try to give this a go with just me, so... Let me know how it goes. I don't know if I'm going to be doing video or if it's going to be audio only. We'll see. And I thought, what better time to start than with the announcement of a brand new console, the Nintendo Switch. Uh, there's a lot of things to talk about, and I have a lot of feelings. Well, not a lot of feelings, but there's a lot of things to talk about. And the Nintendo Switch is definitely Nintendo going in a little bit of a different direction here. Um, in some cases, you can see in the ad itself that there are no children. And, you know, the last commercial that we saw coming out of Nintendo uh, was for Pokemon. The last two, I would say, um, that you know you would see on TV, in the very least. I'm not talking about the, the Nintendo Direct stuff, but stuff that released by Nintendo, you know, for a product. And these just weren't like, you know, 18-year-olds, but these were like mid-20s. So... I don't know if that's the target audience they're going to try to shoot for more so this time around. Um, because, you know, Nintendo is more of a family-friendly, you know, kid-focused kind of a company. And it, for the most part, it's worked out for them. Granted, the Wii U hasn't done particularly well, which is why we're getting a new console so very quickly. So you can see why Nintendo Wii U sales are down. Because, hey, there's a new console coming out in March. That's... Not very far away at all. That's five months away, uh, or less than, because we're almost done here with October. And we aren't going to be hearing any official information until a new Nintendo Direct on, was it January 17th? January 12th. Um, of course, we've learned more information since the announcement, you know, three and a half minute trailer about certain things, but... For the most part, it's just going to be speculation and hearsay. So there's there's going to be small things like leaked out and figured out by January 12th. But for the most part, we're going to be kept in the dark until, you know, just three months before the actual console comes out, which is kind of weird. We really haven't seen this kind of PR cycle for a console before. But then again, we've never had a console, you know, so closely to the last console. But we know why Nintendo is doing this. They still want to stay relevant in the home console arena that they still own on portables, on mobiles. People saying, oh, iPhones, iPads, blah, blah, blah. Nintendo 3DS is still selling better than your their Wii U's or your 360's, your Xbox One's, your PS4's, your PS3's, your, your Ouya's, your anything. 3DS dominates, absolutely dominates. The, the Nintendo DS, their portable before it, is the best-selling console ever. And, or at least it's their best-selling product. I don't know, it's close to PS2, I'm not exactly sure. I can't remember. But they aren't doing terrible. And this last quarter, um, they haven't made a lot of ground. Uh, they did make some money, I think it was $112 million on their sale, on their shares from the Seattle Mariners, but Amiibo sales are down, console sales are down, and the stock prices went up, I think it was 8% when they said we're going to announce the new console tomorrow, and the console gets announced, and then it drops like 12%, which is absolutely normal, it's not like they were like, oh boy, here it comes, and the stockholders are like, what is this, panic, sell all the shares, that's not exactly what happened, this kind of thing happens with everything, it happens with Apple, happens with Sony, happens with Microsoft, happens with anybody, so that's not like a sign for danger, but let's talk about what we did see in this three and a half minute thing. So it's a console portable hybrid, which we all expected. It's what everything pointed towards, and these 
uh, schematics for what the Switch would look like were leaked months beforehand, but we didn't know if they were legitimate or not because there's all these other supposed leaks and, you know, uh, trademarks and patents and all of these things, which some of them are legitimate because Nintendo and other companies throw out a ton of patents, just they don't capitalize on all of them or they don't go through with all of them. They just want to cover their bases, uh, especially so they can, you know, um, be in control of their own intellectual property and nobody else can take that idea. And they might, it might be successful, it might not be. So that's just what they have done. And it, the trailer itself didn't blow me away, but console, you know, announcements don't do that. They're not, like, designed to do that, because, you know, it's a, it's a home console. We don't, we don't really expect anything crazy. Um, you know, when, when the PS4 and the Xbox One came out, it was all about, you know, resolution, always internet cap capable, you know, is going to be updating, and... Uh, always on mode and stuff like that and then there was you know the cameras which Xbox bundled in but PlayStation saw that what Xbox was doing said we're not bundling in our camera and that was a smart move and then there was all kinds of articles spewing half truths about things and uh, the PS4 has had this lead uh, for quite some time but Xbox still doing okay but the Wii U is dragging behind especially when you compare it to what the Wii did so this next step for Nintendo is definitely crucial. I think even if the Switch doesn't do incredibly well, which it most likely won't, is I'm going to say, it's not going to be like the end of Nintendo. They're not going to go the Sega route and, you know, drop the Dreamcast and get out of making their own consoles and just sell out the license to other companies as much as some people might like that for whatever reason. Uh, Nintendo is not doing terrible. They can lose, you know, $10 million a day for a long time and still be pretty darn good. Just based off of how much money they've stockpiled from DS and 3DS sales. And don't forget how well the Wii sold. They made money on that shit. And that's um, one of the things about Nintendo. It's not so much the graphical capabilities. Nintendo hasn't been cutting edge since the N64 days. Because when the GameCube came out, it was kind of outshone by the PS2. And then much later, granted by the Xbox as well, but when it came to the Wii and the Wii U, we saw smaller systems with a lower price model than the competition, or at least the competition that we have uh, here in America and in Japan, and Microsoft doesn't do very well at all. It's all about Sony and Nintendo because those are those companies and, you know, the way that they advertise and stuff like that, and obviously the properties that each console is privy to. So... With, with this, we don't know what the price model is going to be. We don't know exactly how powerful it is. I mean, the Wii U is more powerful than the PS3 or the Xbox 360, even though some people don't give it credit for that. They just mark it, uh, they compare it to what the other consoles currently can do. You know, we have the Xbox One S and the, the PS4 Pro that are going to be 4K capable, and then we don't even have the Scorpion yet. And then VR is the big thing when Nintendo... Or, PlayStation just launched their VR thing, and people are speculating that Microsoft might be doing the same thing with Scorpio, and Nintendo still might be going that direction, because they did, remember, start the innovation, they started the motion control craze, uh, I wouldn't call it a gimmick because of how successful it was, and for how long, you know, we still saw cameras being bundled in at launch with the with Microsoft, even though me and many others don't care about motion uh, technology, especially when it's not fantastic and you know the voice control thing isn't that great either but nintendo still might be going down the vr route a lot of people speculated this that they would try to go from the ground up and make a vr capable console to you know get a technical advantage over the ps4 and xbox one but now that we know that playstation that stuff is going to be uh, vr capable and currently is um and that they Xbox platforms are graphically going to be capable of doing this. Uh, they, Microsoft just doesn't have their own uh, platform for that yet. I mean, they can still play the wait and see game, see how all of these other VR things, which I think is a gimmick and is not long lasting. Not that it'll disappear because um, there's still a lot of improvements to be made. Like, well, we, we saw the motion control in the Wii and we're like, oh, this is cool and it's one-to-one -one almost and it's great. And then the Wii U uh, the Wii Plus add-on came out, and the 
motion controls were much better. So we knew that the, the capabilities of what we can do with other types of non-traditional controller technologies hadn't reached their peak. So I think VR has a lot of more steps to go, but the price point that it's at and the rigs that are you are necessary to run it aren't going to put it into... It, it is in the mainstream, like it already is, but it's not going to be the standard. You're not going to be like, you launched a console without VR? How do you expect to you know compete? It's not, it's not going to be like that. And I think what VR is right now is just going to be a flash in the pan, overhyped, people really don't buy it, the install base isn't that great, and the games aren't going to be that great because of the uh, technical limitations with what we have uh, with the controllers and just with the interface as a whole. But we do know, um, you know, Nintendo's been giving us a little bit more, a little bit more, and then there's, you know, also speculations and supposed leaks that there are going to be additional accessories to the Nintendo Switch. Um, many people have mocked up their own, uh, uh, you know, those those things that you slide on to the to the screen. I forget what they're called some some uh, Joy-Con, the Joy-Con controllers. People are speculating there will be different Joy-Con controllers for different games. Like maybe one will be like more gun shaped for a gun game, or one will have like a, a camera thing for like a Pokemon Snap kind of thing, or a different one for Splatoon. And I can definitely see them doing that. Because this is the first modular controller that's part of the system. You know, we've we've seen you know some things like you know the Xbox One uh, Elite controller that is a bit modular. You can swap out analog sticks and and the D pad, and you have hair trigger controls and paddles and all that good stuff um, but you know it doesn't launch with the console that's not what you know every developer is you know, like they're not programming their games for this controller but with the Joy-Con you can definitely see them implementing more um, native things changes with their own controllers and I don't know how expensive these Joy-Con things are going to be I've heard that the right Joy-Con one has uh, uh, an IR camera on it so we don't know if there's gonna, what other accessories are going to be with the Switch at launch or b bundled within the game. We don't know if we've seen everything yet, but Nintendo president uh, said that there will be hardware accessories for the Switch that haven't yet been shown. Whether these come with the console or if they're ancillary is yet to be seen, and we probably won't hear anything on that front until the January 12th Nintendo Direct. So they can go that route. Also, it is already uh, the same size screen that we've seen from, you know, Oculus and, you know, Samsung uh, Gears. So they could theoretically make it into a VR system, whether they've already made that technology or not, because of the screen is modular and you can just slide it into some sort of VR headset interface. That is absolutely within their realm of possibilities to do if they if, if, they're, if they're going for that right off the get-go is questionable uh, but at least it's on the table it's something that you know one or two years down the road if they wanted to do they definitely could um, but that that's if they want to go for the VR um, uh, community that's if, if they want to go for that audience the VR audience and I would assume that most VR people into VR currently uh, wouldn't go to Nintendo because, you know, they aren't going to have the same graphical capabilities, but, you know, they're going to have the IPs that people love. You know, if they make a VR Mario or Kirby or Yoshi or Pokemon, um, I think it would be very smart for the Nintendo Switch to actually have a legitimate Pokemon title on the console. It's not going to be at launch. Um, but within the first year or year and a half, I think would be very smart. Just look at what Pokemon Go did. It actually really spiked Pokemon game sales on the 3DS, whether it be the uh, digital versions of Pokemon Blue, Yellow, and Red, or Pokemon Auras, or Pokemon X and Y. They saw those sales go up. And, uh, you know, when you're talking alone, you get thirsty, so... I do apologize, but I mean, we're talking about video games, so I'm drinking Mountain Dew Game Fuel. Plug? Not really. So, Nintendo has a lot of directions that they could go based off of what we don't know about the Switch. 
But these Joy-Con controllers, as far as what they did show in the trailer, it was just kind of meh. I don't really want to put the screen on a, you know, on a desk or a table, take the Joy-Cons off and then play it like that, because it's not like the Wii with the Nunchuck and Wiimote, where they were basically like parts of a controller just separated. These are tiny, thin little things, these Joy-Cons, so I don't feel like it would be that comfortable. They're very small and they're very thin. They're not, you know, grippy. And we, we see, we saw, you know, three different ways to play the game as far as controllers goes. Either, you know, with the screen on the go, put it on the, uh, the, the Switch Grip controller, I believe they called it, which was the more traditional looking one. At least the one that they showed in the living room. And then they had the Pro Controller, which was, I definitely think, a good sign because a lot of people really didn't like the controls of the Wii or the Wii U, you know, with this super annoying giant gamepad. And a lot of the games, you have to have the gamepad to play it. You can't play it with a uh, Pro Controller. You know, some games you can, but there's many games where this is the only controller that you can use. And while it feels fine, it operates fine, doesn't have great battery life. Um, it's not the most comfortable thing. It's kind of heavy. In some games, you actually have to look at the screen, and then you get this jarring effect of changing perspectives. Just just play uh, Star Fox Zero or watch one of my videos or streams of it. That actually was a nightmare, and they handled that very poorly. So I can, I can definitely appreciate them showing us the Pro Controller out the get-go, and it's more of a traditional-looking controller like we see with the 360 uh, with the analog sticks not on the same plane. You know, they they, 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 they switched it up um, to be less like, you know, the PlayStation and more like the 360 controller, which is just what I'm more comfortable with. Maybe you're completely different, but we've seen uh, the pro controllers of the past. Um, you know, the very first one that was kind of like the SNES shaped, that had both analog sticks at the bottom. And with the, the Wii U pro controller, it was different. So I'm glad to see it. It would probably be separate, sold separately. Um, I would prefer if they would just give us, you know, all of the uh, different ways of controlling the game out of the box. But I, I highly doubt that they'll be going down that road. You'll probably just get the Joy-Cons and the grip controller. But, you know, because it's modular, they can have completely different looking controllers, not just different Joy-Cons, but the completely different controllers to put the Joy-Cons onto. So it's very interesting to think of what the possibilities are for different ways to control the game, which is kind of the, almost the exact opposite from the Wii U, where in many cases you were very limited in how you can control your game. So that I do appreciate. They also had that fake esports event with Splatoon, which was really weird for me because Splatoon is not an esport. Also, they had like a group of like professional, you know, Asian gamers going up against like, you know, the bunch of Joe Nobodies. You know, these different people of different sizes and ages and sexes and races on one like ragtag team. Like, that was that was pretty Disney Channel guys. That was that wasn't uh, that wasn't very convincing, but you know it is what it is. But I don't understand why they showed Splatoon as an esport event when Nintendo does have an esport game. There's only one of them or two actually. And it's Smash Brothers. That's that's the only Nintendo esport franchise that really we have. There is no competitive Splatoon. There's no competitive. Mario Kart. And the games that they did show, a lot of people were like, uh, oh, Bethesda said that Skyrim isn't officially on the console, and oh, look, that Mario game, which we don't know if it's a game or if it's a tech demo or whatever, look, it was superimposed on the screen, and it's like, well, yeah, that's how every single company does that. You know, you don't have real actors playing real games in person. You know, that just doesn't make sense. Everybody superimposes onto a screen uh, what in game is being played or, you know, played. Um, thankfully, you know, the actors weren't doing the things that we always see in sitcoms where people are like, oh, 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 video games! We're pressing all the buttons and we're, you know, doing, you know, IRLDI with everything. You know, just completely over-the-top garbage and they're just saying jargon that's just not in video games. Um... So at least that didn't happen. But yeah, of course that Mario game was superimposed. Of course that dude had no idea that Skyrim was going to be on the screen. 
or that, you know, Splatoon or Mario Kart, A, you're not going to show a bunch of random actors and extras what this game is going to be like, because, you know, that's how leaks happen. Um, also, you would have to have, like, a, a playable build of all these games, which I'm sure most of them aren't at a, past a pre-alpha stage at this point. And, uh, and B, it just, it just makes sense from a production uh, uh, point of view. So, yeah, obviously. And sometimes with commercials, we do not see things on the screen, you know, screen, that we actually see IRL. In-game stuff that actually comes out. We see that a lot. Sometimes it's things that uh, often do not come to fruition, or they get changed, or it was just a tech demo, or just something to demonstrate, like, look, well, we're running something on this new... Uh, platform or UI, but isn't going to be, you know, this game, because either this game is really old or, or you know, this game isn't, uh, you know, the demographic we're going for, things like that. Completely, completely understandable. So maybe Skyrim comes out, maybe it doesn't. Um, you know, they showed that list of developers that are going to be producing games for the Nintendo Switch, and it's like, there was a lot of filler names in there. They did have some big names, uh, but there was still uh, quite a few missing. Uh, Scene Square Enix on there was pretty promising. You know, who knows if, you know, Kingdom Hearts 3 is going to be coming out. You know, if, if it does, it'd probably be like a year after it comes out on PS4 and Xbox One. But who knows? I mean, that Kingdom Hearts 3 probably won't come out until 2018. Anyways, let's be realistic. Um, but at, at the same time, we don't know what games are going to be on the Nintendo Switch. Now, we, we heard rumors that there were going to be mostly ports at launch, or, you know, in the launch window, that there was going to be some sort of uh, Mario game that would probably be an original game, would be my guess. I don't know if it's the one that they showed, or if that was a tech demo, or, you know, something like something really early of what they were building on. You know, it's still running on the same engine, but it's a completely different looking game than what we saw on this trailer. Um, that there was going to be a Mario Kart port, a Splatoon port, and a Smash Bros. port. That's what we heard, you know, a few months ago. And we did see two of those where, you know, that was Mario Kart 8, but had different features. It had King Boo. It looked like, uh, I think that was Roy, you know, the Koopa Kid Roy. Um, and it was a, a Yoshi course. So, like, that stuff wasn't in the game. And in Splatoon, they showed different hairstyles and a different map from what we've seen uh, in the Splatoon game that we currently have. So we don't know if that's going to be a brand new Splatoon game. It's going to be a port of the old one with additional content. Um, this Mario Kart game looks like it's going to be a port of Mario Kart 8 with additional content. Who knows what they're going to name it or if they're going to try to pass it off as Mario Kart 9. Or do they pull a Microsoft and just skip the, le the number 9 and go straight to 10, Mario Kart 10? <laughs> Who knows? Who knows what they're going to do? Um, we did see Breath of the Wild, which is the only game that we know is coming out for the Nintendo Switch that's going to be at or near launch. And based off of what we've heard uh, Breath of the Wild's release date is going to be, definitely coincides with the Switch's release. So it's definitely, if not day one, going to be well within the launch window. And that's going to be very interesting. It's similar to Twilight Princess, which you know was announced a long time ago, uh, before the Wii was even envisioned, uh, but it kept getting delayed, as Zelda games typically do. And, you know, when it was going to come out is when the Wii was going to come out, but they had already been promised GameCube players that they were going to be able to play it too. So they released it on both, and they're going to be doing the same thing here with the Breath of the Wild. So we don't know which version is going to be better, if, you know, the Switch version is going to have additional content. Who knows? We know that we have all of these new Zelda Amiibos. We know that the Switch is going to have Amiibo support. They even showed Amiibos uh, in this trailer Although they didn't show it being used with the console, we don't know if it has an NFC reader, um, either on the, the touchpad, which it is a multi-point touchpad, which is uh, unlike the uh, the Wii pad, which is just uh, omni-touch. This is going to be multi-touch like you have on your smartphones, which you can notice, but if you, you know, pinch and squeeze stuff. So it's, uh, it's going to be multi-touch. Um, we've known, you know, we've, we've been pretty confident that it was going to be a touch screen and then it came out and they didn't say it was touch screen, but we know it's going to be a touch screen and it's going to be, uh, have multi-touch inputs. So, and we, and if not in the same way as Nintendo's mooted IR camera motion tracking. So we don't know if ports of, you know, either they be digital or updated like with Mario Kart or Splatoon. We don't know if Wii U games 
that require the gamepad are going to be playable on the Switch. Um, you know, is there, you know, uh, motion controls within this little screen? It, it's definitely, as you can see, the just the size of this baby. We don't know how much of this technology they can shrink down into there or in the Joy-Cons. Some of it could be in the Joy-Cons, or that we could just require different Joy-Cons to play Wii U games like you would just with a touchpad. So that that all is very, very interesting. It doesn't really get me excited, and it get a lot of people excited. It got some people excited because, oh, new console, it's Nintendo. I like Nintendo, I like the last console, or I like owning all the consoles, so I'm going to buy it. Completely understandable. Um, I'm not super amped about it thus far, but I have no reasons to go like, ugh. You know, it wasn't it wasn't something that really scared me away. It's just kind of like, okay, that's what we expected. Oh, that's interesting. Mm, why would you want to play the game on that? that? I assume most people are not going to play it, you know, in a car with the little Joy-Cons. But it's something that's available to you, especially if you have children and, you know, it is portable. So I feel like I don't think it's going to be replacing the 3DS like many people thought. You know, this is going to be a console handheld hybrid. So is it replacing both the Wii U and the 3DS? I don't think it's going to be like that. I think it's kind of more like doing what the Vita did, but better when it came to remote play. It's just basically I think it's going to be a better version of remote play where you can play it mobily and we do know that the screen is 720p so not ideal but it is nintendo we're talking about they don't go for the highest resolution that's or uh you know the the meat and potato graphic monster powerhouses that sony and microsoft may be gearing towards nintendo really cares about the look the size and the pricing points nintendo's been the cheapest console for the past, I mean, including the Switch, which I assume, and I think this is a safe assumption, it'll be cheaper than the Xbox One and the PS4. Um, you know, maybe it'll be a 350 price point. Some people are hitting that as a sweet spot. Many people are like, it needs to be 300. I don't know. I don't know about that. That stuff is really, really difficult to um, predict what price point would do best. Uh, obviously, there are some some aspects were is kind of obvious but like yeah the xbox one would have sold a little better if it didn't have the camera because then it'd be the same price as the ps4 and you wouldn't have some people going well the ps4 is cheaper i'm gonna buy that instead where maybe they would have gone for the xbox one so there are some obvious things like that but uh, for the most part it's hard to predict because some people thought that the wii would be the worst selling out of the consoles of its generation and it was the best by a pretty good margin. And PS3 and Xbox 360 ended up tied at the end, even though 360 uh, had a, a large lead early on. And some of that had to do with pricing as well. But it all matters about the games. Maybe not for some people, but I feel like for most people, and that speaks to whatever platform that you play on, if you play... Mostly Nintendo games, probably because you like Ninten the, you know, the Nintendo first-party titles. You like Mario, Kirby, Yoshi, Pokemon, Star Fox, you know, you like those games. You know, either if it's nostalgic for you, or you just think they're really well made, or you just you need to have it. And there are some people that play on the PlayStation 4 because they like, you know, the Uncharted's and, you know, whatever Naughty Dog is going to do for PS4. And, uh, you know, their exclusives, you know, Infamous or, you know, Resistance or things like that. And there's some people who like the Xbox games like Gears of War or Dead Rising. And there are some people on PC who like to have, you know, all of the, you know, lower budget games and buying early uh, access things on Steam, you know, at a lower price and Steam sales and things like that. So the games are the things that matter. Remember, Wii Sports was a console seller and it came with the console, which definitely helped spread news and awareness and made it such a huge juggernaut um it wasn't just because oh this is a different way to play the game i like it and that's why it sold no we sports implemented that technology very very well and it was the game and the game play that sold the wii because of largely due to wii sports at least initially so it is the games that matter the most now pricing and maybe other capabilities 
have a lot of uh, large factors to some demographics, but the games are what you buy a console for. You don't buy it because it can play Netflix or Twitch or you know YouTube or whatever, or integrate with Facebook and Twitter and all that shit that some of the companies have been really hammering on for a while. We don't need it to be an all-in-one system. We need it to play video games because it's a video game console. Well, most people have PCs or laptops or phones or iPads to do a lot of that other stuff. We don't need a gaming console to do it. Some of those ancillary things are nice, and especially if it's exclusive, uh, whether it be technical reasons or legal reasons, uh, tied to one or two consoles, you know, that's fine and dandy. But it's the games that matter the most, and what Nintendo decides to do with their controllers, I think, is very important because of what we saw when this thing was disastrous. Now, it wasn't always. You know, there's some cool things with the touchpad. Um, there were some cool things with the Wii, um, with certain games that were a little nicer than they were on the 360 or the PS3 because of, you know, different capabilities, because it was made by sometimes different companies, you know, it was outsourced uh, for a Wii port sometimes, and sometimes it was a bad thing. Sometimes it was quasi-good or the same. But often, because of the different control scheme that the Wii had um, internally, it changed the way that you played the games. And I feel like with the Nintendo Switch, it's it was definitely it was definitely very important for them to nail a console controller that was more in line with what we see with the PS the PlayStations and the Xboxes of the world because the lack of third party support really hurt them you know late in the Wii stages and right out the get go with the Wii U we we haven't seen an EA sports game from them in a while and we just or sports games really in general from third-party developers. And right out the gate, we see NBA 2K17 being played outside on a basketball court, because, yeah, that that's something that people are going to do. Um, but, but, yeah, so if it does get the support, if it does get developers excited, and we've, we've even heard on substantiated reports that there is a developer that's leaving PlayStation 4 support to go to Nintendo Switch... Now, I don't know what company this supposedly is or if it's true or not, but if a, a console makes it easy for you to develop games for them, and especially if it's a place like EA that, you know, sells Madden, you know, you know, back in the day it would sell on the 360, the PS3, and the Wii, and the, and the Vita, or the, the PSP, and 3DS sometimes, uh, and then you'd have mobile versions of it. Those, those kind of games are easier to spread around if you have a more um, static platform to build upon uh, initially, and then you can port it over to other systems you know, with varying degrees of success based off of how you uh, handle it and how those consoles run as a whole. So Nintendo needs other third-party support, much more so than they with the Wii U, and it needs better shit out of Nintendo games. It needs more of them. We haven't had an F-Zero game since GameCube, guys. That's That'll be three console generations without an F-Zero game if there's not one on the Switch. And it'll sell well. The last one did. If they're gonna bring something like Star Fox, they can't fuck it up with their controls. Now, like, they tried to go with Let's go back to what did work with solo flying, even though they made the little robot chicken. Uh, freaking Niwatori R-Wing form. They at least tried to stick to more with what used to work, but they didn't with the controls. And when it comes to other games, such as the Metroid games, which, I mean, Metroid Prime sold very well. All side-scrolling Metroid games sold very well. It'd be on Game Boy or Super Nintendo or Game Boy Advanced. Make a Metroid game. And don't make it this Freedom Force Fighters games on the 3DS, which for some people is like, no, it was better than we thought it'd be, but still not great or, you know, super good. And But for the most people, it was like, what is this shit? This isn't Metroid. Give us a Metroid game. So they need to do that within that vein. They need to make the games like Zelda Breath of the Wild that continue on with what worked in the previous games. Not to say that they're, you know, don't try to innovate or change things, because we did see, we have seen some 
successes, but take a look at like some of the uh, Mario games, like Mario Kart or you know the Mario sports games, where you know they're always changing things up, um, and they they always work, even if the uh, the last one was different and the one after it was different. They all kind of seem to work because of the quality that they put into those games. Sometimes they get lucky, or sometimes they just have ideas that just absolutely work. They just, they just, it works. And sometimes it doesn't work, as we've seen with some of the motion controls on Wii games and Wii U games. And hopefully with the Switch, there isn't going to be such a huge emphasis on motion controls. I have a sneaking suspicion that there will be something. I don't know if there's going to be accelerometers in the Joy-Cons or the pad, but it definitely seems like they are switching the focus away. I remember well, one of the Nintendo higher-ups blaming a lot of the lack of success for the Wii U and its gamepad due to other mobile forms of gaming, most likely the iPad is what he was alluding to because, you know, that's the one that this resembles the most. So he was blaming the success and speed of that market for why the Wii U didn't do so well. And it's like, yeah, no, that's that wasn't it. That wasn't it. Sorry, dude. But, you, I mean, sure, you could have made this better, but it wasn't the iPad's fault that the Wii U didn't do so well. So hopefully the Switch is going to be more friendly for other developers to work on and develop games for. And the bits of innovation that they are striving for, either, you know, out the get-go or maybe a year or two in advance, those other developers can capitalize on either because it's similar to what they've already done on, say, you know, VR platforms or just other games on PlayStation or Xbox. Or the Switch just has different capabilities that they don't have. So a little mixture of both would be good. And we don't know, like, like I said, how powerful the Switch is going to be. I think we can expect it to be more powerful than the Wii U, but not 4K... I don't think that would happen, you know, even at a later date. That's not what Nintendo is known for. That's not what the, that's not a priority to them, and it hasn't been. So I don't, especially with you know, very few leadership changes uh, in the past decade. I don't see them shifting away from that focus, which is you know, a double-edged sword. You know, if they made a console more like the PlayStation Four or the Xbox One, then it would they would be more like it, so they can get more ports. You know, based off of, you know, do they have a good install base? Do the developers feel like that's something that can still make money off of? But if it's different enough, then it separates them from the Xbox and the PlayStation, where pretty much the biggest difference between those two is the games that you can play. They're both, they both look gorgeous. They're both very comparable in graphics, megahertz, and memory is now modular, and now they're both going to be 4K supportive, you know, with streaming. And they're, you know, they run Blu-ray discs. We know that Nintendo Switch is running off of cartridges, which is fine. Obviously, there will be no physical backwards compatibility for any Wii U or 3DS. This is going to be the first Nintendo product that does not have any form of backwards compatibility since the GameCube. So... A lot of people are going to be upset about that because like, oh, you've had backwards compatibility, so we're sad that you took it away. And there are just some people that are like, backwards compatibility is the most important thing. We saw a lot of that about that at launch of the Xbox One and the PS4 complaining about lack of backwards compatibility, where the numbers show that that doesn't help increase sales and that people are going to be buying games for the new console, not for the old console. That, that, that market is very, very small like they did with, say, uh, Dragon Age Inquisition or Destiny. They had those games on the last generation of consoles, but they didn't sell very well, and people do not play it on there anymore, and they haven't for a long time. So video game companies know where the money goes. So if you have complaints about backwards compatibility, you're just making a, a, a very personal argument for yourself and nothing else. Be like, oh, I know people who, like, we've seen the numbers... We know what people buy, we know what sells well, and we know where people are playing their games because you play online. You know, for many of these multiplayer games, you play online, therefore we can look at the numbers to see where people are playing them from and on what. So, 
it, it, it is, you know, it's kind of nice to be able to play Wii games on the Wii U, but I've done that twice. Um, the backwards compatibility digital thing for the Xbox One is, is pretty neat, and PlayStation doesn't look like they are going that way, and they don't really need to. Um, but with digital libraries are always going to be a thing, so we know that there will be, you know, Mario Brothers is going to get a, a, a Switch port, and Sonic the Hedgehog is going to get a Switch port, you know... A lot of the things that we've seen on the Wii U shop, eShop, and the Wii Shop, and 3DS Shop, a lot of that is going to be obviously available on the Switch because that's just what happens. But as far as physical backwards compatibility, that's not going to be a thing, and that's not a bad thing. As far as the cartridges go, of course it's going to be a proprietary technology because, you know, A, it's Nintendo, and B, it's Nintendo. And that's just what they like doing. They've done that, you know, since the GameCube with their smaller disc because they were like, oh, the PS2 piracy, you know, thing, you know, burning discs and all that stuff. That was something that they were, you know, really just trying to stay away from. And, you know, who knows how much that helped or hurt them. You know, that's a very negligible kind of thing. But we know that, you know, SD cards nowadays can be up to a terabyte. So it's not like memory is going to be an issue on these things. Who knows what, you know, they're going to be capable of memory-wise. Um, but of course this thing is going to have a hard drive and it needs to be bigger than the fucking Wii U's hard drive, which at best is, was what? I mean, not even 500 gigabytes, right? None of them had, none, none of the Wii U's have that. Um, and you know, that was small, I feel, for the PS4 and the Xbox One when they launched. It's like 500 gigabytes, that shit needs to be at least a terabyte, son. But at least we can now have our portable drives to combat that, and hopefully the Switch um, will have those capabilities as well. Of course, you know, with the Wii and the Wii U, we've been able to use SD cards for some of those memory limitations, um, but I feel like for the Switch, get with the times, digital sales are doing very well on the 3DS, and that thing has really uh, limited um, memory issues as well, so maybe you try to do better on the Switch as far as uh, a hard drive goes. Granted, it's it's not going to be, like, a lot. I would be mildly surprised if it was a terabyte, because that drives up the price, and Nintendo wants a lower price point. They want a slimmer, sleeker console. Just look at the Wii U. Look at the uh, Wii. Look at the GameCube. It was always the smallest. It was always the cheapest. And that's very important uh, to Nintendo and the Japanese audience that they shoot for. They know how marketing works there, and sometimes that feels kind of weird to some of us Westerners, um, but that's just the way that it is, and that's the way it's going to be. So, I think that's enough talk about the Nintendo Switch. There's one more thing uh, that I want to uh, bring up, and I'm only going to talk about very important things here on this podcast, whatever it is I decide to call it. Who knows if I'll even release this or if it'll ever get a name, but... Candy. America's favorite Halloween candy by state in 2015. An annual list of Halloween candy, which is most popular in each state of the last year, according to Influencer. That's a really terrible name. But it was a survey, and you can see the map, um, what it, the breakdown is by state. And I'm going to have to call bullshit on this. They said that they their sample size was 42,000 candy eaters nation ride right before 2015's Halloween. So 4,200, that's a good sample size. That's, you know, I mean, it gives you a confidence interval of definitely a very small amount. But just look at the results. It doesn't, <laughs> it doesn't make any sense whatsoever. Just look at this shit. This is, this is obviously a lie. And there's a lot of, a lot of things right off the get-go that make you go, the fuck? First off, candy corn. Candy corn is not only supposedly the most popular candy in Oregon, Texas, Tennessee, and South Carolina. Oh, and uh, and Utah, but or not Utah, sorry, Colorado. But it's the most popular in the country, which is <laughs> bullshit. Absolute <laughs> bullshit. There's no way that's true. Um, do you know anybody who likes candy corn? No, you don't, because nobody likes candy corn. Nobody likes candy corn. It's not even like a brand name. It's a generic thing that you don't really get trick-or-treating very often. You don't see it in stores outside of Halloween. And it also tastes terrible. 
So I don't know where they're, they're getting that information that not only it won so many states, but that it's the number one overall. That's a straight up fucking lie. And we'll get into the actual numbers in a bit, but we have more objections here. Lifesavers is the number one candy in California, which you know is incorrect based off of a couple things. One, it's Lifesavers. When you think candy, Lifesavers isn't really on your radar. You see, you know, Jolly Ranchers, Milky Way, Three Musketeers, Snicker, Twizzlers, Twix, 100 Grand, Sour Patch, Crunch Bars. You're like, yeah, candy, Butterfinger, uh, Reese's. You don't think Lifesavers. That's not something that many people reach for in the impulse buy section at a grocery store. So that is a red flag as it is. Second off, it's California, the most populous state in the country. So sure, maybe there's more diversity and therefore you're gonna have a lot more different candies in higher numbers just because of the based off of the population, no matter what the sample size is that you get. But second of all, it's the second biggest, it's the biggest state by population and it's the only one that chose Lifesavers. Can you believe it? Can you name anything else besides, you know, maybe a sports team where it's the most popular in California and not somewhere else? It's the biggest state by population. Most, more the majority or the plurality of people live there. So you would think if the biggest state by population likes Lifesavers, you know, maybe some others would follow suit. Nope. Not a single other state chose Lifesavers. So that's a, obviously a lie. Also, there's way too much variation in this. Look at this. Airheads, Jolly Rancher, Butterfinger, Kit Kat, Candy Corn, Milky Way, Toblerone, Snickers, 100 Grand, M&M's, Twizzlers, Hershey's Kiss, Laffy Taffy, uh, Swedish Fish, Airheads, Pixie Sticks, Crunch Bars, uh, Sweet Tarts, Almond Joy, Tootsie Roll, Starburst, Reese's, Reese's Pieces, Whoppers, Almond Joy. I already said that. That's way too many. There's no way that states are that divided by the candy that they choose. There's no way. There's no way there's more than like five or six candies that rule every single state. There, there is, there's very little, there's, there's very little consensus. It's so, it's so weird to think that the states are, you know, there's not like, I mean, you can understand in some places like, oh, you know, this is where M&Ms are made. And even though the place where M&Ms are made looks like is owned by airheads. So that doesn't uh, coincide with, you know, a, a plausible theory that, you know, where a, a candy is produced, it would be best selling because that's where the factory is. There's going to be, you know, more factory stores there or it's going to sell well or people take pride or people travel there and they buy those in bulk. Stuff like that. That doesn't coincide as well. And, and then another another weird one. West Virginia's favorite candy, apparently, according to Influencer, is Oreos. Oreos. Not a candy. So, another reason not to trust this survey at all is Oreos is not a candy. So, I don't know if the people in West Virginia just are really unsure what candy is, because I doubt they, this was like a multiple choice kind of a thing. Um, we don't know exactly how they conducted their survey. But the fact that things are varied so far, like, yeah, Pennsylvania's favorite candy is Swedish Fish. That outs, that's more popular than Milky Way, Three Musketeers, Snickers, Crunch, Butterfinger, Kit Kat, Reese's. Swedish Fish is a juggernaut in Pennsylvania? Not one of the big candy makers? No. I mean, I mean maybe there would be a couple of states that are, like, outside the norm for a couple of reasons. But, look, Kit Kat owns one state. Reese's owns two states, and Reese's Pieces owns or, uh, two other states. Uh, Snickers owns two states. Th that just doesn't make any sense whatsoever, especially when you look at the actual numbers. The U.S. candy market share percent uh, that was conducted in 2015, where the candy... Uh, Candy makes $2.3 billion a year. And uh, th that's a lot. Or no, that's not just candy. That's Hershey Co. That's, you know, Hershey. That's, so candy is a pretty big market. And, you know, Halloween is like their big holiday. But if you look at the market share by percent, this isn't... I mean, maybe the, the candy you sell, the, you buy the most isn't your favorite for whatever reason. But 
it, that usually coincides. You usually buy the thing you like the most. And by far, for a long time now, the number one candy in America, year over year, has been Reese's. Reese's peanut butter cups. You, you read one of these articles every year around this time, usually. Reese's the most popular candy in America. Again, and again, and again, and again. Second place, M&M's. Third best selling is Snickers. Then it's Kit Kat, Hershey's, and then Trident, Orbit, Mars, Twizzlers, Ghirardelli, Twix, Crunch, Sweetest Fish. So that's the U.S. candy market share. And if you take a look at, uh, you know, the different companies, you know, Mars Bars, Lint, Hershey Co., Ferrara, you know, that, you know, that's basically companies that doesn't, you know, uh, whittle it down per candy. But when you, like, look at the per candy, um, fucking Lifesavers isn't in that shit. Fucking Laffy Taffy isn't in that. Nerds, Jolly Ranchers, you don't see that. You see things that you see in stores. You see kids take home for Halloween. And the shit that you most likely buy the most. You, uh, I have a hard time believing that Toblerone is the most popular candy in Arizona. No, it's probably Snickers or, or Reese's or Crunch or Kit Kat. That's just statistically more plausible than Toblerone. In a, in a place like Arizona, it's not like Arizona is like 12 people and they're like, well, five of them really love Toblerone, so that threw off the data. It's like, no, they, they interviewed 42,000, or they, you know, they surveyed 42,000 candy eaters, and somehow they came up with Texas's loving candy corn and California loving lifesavers, which, that's, no way, that's impossible. And they have the best selling candy in America, owning two states, four if you count Reese's Pieces. So, I'm sorry, I just had to talk about this because it's bullshit and I saw it a lot on the internet where people were like, oh, I gotta move out of California because they like lifesavers. It's like, no, this is, this is clearly a lie. They have candy corn as the most popular candy, which is impossible because nobody likes candy corn. And it tastes bad, and it doesn't sell well, and it's seasonal. Anyway, this was a podcast. I'm going to try to keep these around an hour, you know, maybe a little less, maybe a little more. Uh, it's not going to be a weekly thing. Maybe there'll be two weeks in a row that have one. Maybe there'll be two weeks in a row that don't have one. So I'll just make them when I want to. Anyways, thank you all for watching. Please leave comments if you've made it this far in this podcast of anything that you have to say. Criticism, stuff that you liked, uh, tell me to cover more subjects, what you don't want to see me cover, what you do want to see me cover. Uh, I'm going to do another podcast next week and... Uh, Some of you aren't going to like it. <laughs>